Welcome, Smarties. Let the adventure begin already. Super teacher. This is going to be just a little bit different than some of the other things I've posted because this is going to be the first in a series. And this series is going to be, get it ready, a Smarty Party with Super Teacher Mama Dr. Robinson. Party at my house. And yours too. So for our Smarty Parties, what we're going to be using is curriculum materials that were loaded by a neighboring school district. And that district is Paramount Unified. Woo! Props to Paramount. Shout out to Paramount Unified. Woohoo! I'm partnering with them. They don't know it yet, but I'm partnering with them. Actually, they're partnering with me. I wanted to provide some curriculum for my students digitally so they could access it whenever they needed to, and it seemed to make sense that if we did it on this platform, other people who needed resources too could just join in. And when I found out from a friend that Paramount Unified had loaded materials that they were making publicly accessible through their website, I thought that was the perfect venue because when I left my classroom, I just walked out with my stuff for the night. I thought, you know, I'm going to be coming back in two weeks. I don't really need to worry. So I left my computer and all my files and all my teacher guides and all my great resources that I use all the time there. But what I did bring is my smart brain. And what I've long said is that all a teacher needs is a stick or maybe just their finger and some sand, a whiteboard and a marker. And now I get to prove my theory. It's got a lot of science, right? Teachers rock. All teachers are super teachers. Now your mom or grandma or dad, they're a rocking super teacher too. So I want to give a shout out to Paramount Unified and I want to invite you to access their resources at this address. So what you'll do is go to www.paramount.k12.ca.us. You can also put in Paramount Unified. It's in the state of California. And when you get to their website, it's their district website, you're going to click on the tab that says Parents, and then underneath it, it's going to say Download. Now, for my grade span, I'm using the K2 instructional packet, but if you have children in other grade levels, they've made that open to you as well. So I'd strongly encourage you to say thank you and use it because most of us are sheltered to home, can't go to a store, and they're closed anyway. And rather than look for a bunch of resources online, which is totally admirable, you can go to Teacher by Teacher, and there's fabulous teachers who have great stuff. But this is accessible, free, they've loaded materials on, they have this particular one has 46 pages to it, it has kindergarten, ELA, and math work packet, but it's for other grades as well. And I'm a TK teacher, so I'm doing this for my TK students specifically, and my former TK students who are in kindergarten, but if you have children that are a little bit younger, or a little bit older, they might like this as well. And as a parent, I'm hoping to provide some resources here to help support you in your journey, your adventure, your corona venture, your coronavirus adventure. So yay, Paramount. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some of their resources. Now, when you get to the one that I've spotlighted, bookmarked, I'm asking you to use. This is what you're going to see on the cover. Kindergarten ELA Math Work Packet 2019-20. And I don't know who loaded it, but woohoo! Whoever did that, a teacher, an administrator, a teacher on special assignment. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't think they had a lot of time to prepare like any of the rest of us. And they didn't know for how long, so they just put in materials that could be easily accessible and accessed and easy to use. The problem is there isn't a lot of other instruction with it. So if you have a struggling learner, you might be tearing your hair out in two hours when they don't get it yet and not knowing how to kind of drive that instruction. And if you have an adapted learner or a gifted learner, they're done. Now what? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And since we're not there yet, what I want to do is provide some augmented instruction to go with their packet. Now this is the first page that I'm using, and if you see, I have it folded in half because they have the ELA and math packet built to where there's an ELA and a math activity, presumably for every day, but I'm only going to focus this lesson on one piece of it. So today this is what we're going to focus on on this video, 
is this right the missing beginning letter so if you were to just hand this to your child which would be totally fine they would easily maybe see pictures say what they saw figure out the beginning letter there are some ancillary materials that I would encourage you to have on hand before you put this in front of your learner and that is some alphabet charts now Paramount hasn't loaded them yet but maybe they will after this but even though they haven't, and I didn't have one at home, I just went on and picked something that was free to download. I'm not providing it because it's not my materials, and we don't really have a central place other than this for you to access content. So I can only speak it into the air and show you. So what I want you to do is get one that has pictures that go with the letters, and preferably look for text that is what you would expect your child to write in manuscript. Sometimes there's really cute, fancy fonts, but if that's not how the school expects to see your child writing, then that's not what you want to put in front of them for these tasks. And if you have something from your school already, because a lot of schools already gave students those, use what you already have, because it ties to the materials they've already learned, so they already have an anchor back, and that's a lot easier than reteaching. I didn't have anything. I didn't provide my students with anything. I'm going to email them stuff. But this is just something I found online. Then I also want to encourage you to get one that doesn't have pictures, that just has the letters. Now, one of the things you probably noticed is that I used a red pen and I kind of highlighted, not highlighted with a highlighter, but I made, it, made you aware as a learner that there are some letters that need to stand out. And what those are is the vowels. Now, in my classroom, I use black for consonants and I use red for vowels, predominantly because when we print or we photocopy, it's most easily done in black and white. And so I just leave black because most of the consonant, most of the letters are consonants, so they stay black. And then I did red because red pen and a teacher, seriously, that's super easy. We have a lot of access to that on our campus because we use them for a lot of things. So it's just readily available colors. You can use any color that you want. Oftentimes when you, when we, maybe you too, purchase things from companies, they'll make the consonants blue like magnets, like Lakeshore and other companies. The consonants will be blue, and then the vowels will be red. There's not a right or wrong. I just didn't want to write blue pen over all this black. It's a lot easier just to leave it black. Here's the reason you're going to do both. Because what you want to do is use these as teaching tools in the event that your child can't generate just from memory what letter should be placed onto the missing letter line. Also, you want to make sure that they're referencing how to correctly form the letter. And this is going to give you upper and lower case, although since we're doing that sheet, focusing on that sheet, none of them will be uppercase. But on other things that you do, these are called ready references. Now what I did is I put a red box around all of the vowels because I want my kids to differentiate between vowel and consonant, and it's easy to just teach it on the go. Every time we come to letters, every time we come to words, I just embed that information. So the more that you do it naturally, the more it just bleeds into their brain into a place that sits very organically and it's easy to retrieve. A lot of times what will happen with students, especially little people, they'll master all these things on all these tests or assessments and then summer comes and they have that little slump and they're not necessarily in school and you may be doing things with them at home but not necessarily the same way that they did it at school and so some of that information falls off, U-shaped curve in learning. It's displaced because it's not necessarily being used the way it was taught repeatedly, so they're not accessing it the same. And then they come back to the next school year, and their next teacher, first grade teacher, kindergarten teacher, is like, did you learn anything last year? And you have all the, the previous teacher has all the assessments, the parent has all the assessments saying, no, they got the little award, I see the little paper, I saw it was circled. So don't be alarmed, but the more that you can put information out there for them to just latch on to naturally, the more it just sits in a place of automaticity where they access it easily. When it comes to retrieval, they just pull it out. What we're doing now is encoding, putting information in. You're going to join me in my field of engineering, educational engineering. They're going to encode, put the information in. They're going to process it, use the information with you, with me. Then they're going to retrieve it when you let them work on independent activities or when you ask them to generate something for you independently. So we're going to use these. I'm going to show you how I use them so that you can know how to use them as well. 
it's kind of presumptive of us sometimes as educators because we do things so much and so often that it becomes second nature to us that our assumption is everybody does that. And a lot of people are teachers, so they will naturally do it, not to step on anyone's expertise. But what, de what comes naturally to us may not come naturally to you. So I'm going to just err on the side of caution and throw extra in in the event that it might support you. And if it doesn't, it'll just reinforce what you already know or it'll give you some tools you didn't have before. So when we come back to this page, and I'm not actually going to work off this page because I want you to either let your child touch my face. I don't have the virus. I can't give it to myself, and I can't give it to you through this media. So I'm not going to use this page. I am going to show you some things to do with it when we're finished. I'm going to use the idea of this page and recreate something else for us to work on so that there's teaching involved. So if your child did this first, they can come to this, and this is support learning, and then I'm going to give you some activity to do post this. Or if they haven't done this yet, you can have them watch this first and then do this independently on their own. And then you can also use the extenders. So when I looked at this page, what I thought was, oh, if I were going to teach this overtly, what steps would I use? One of the things that we use in education is called a step chart or a steps to mastery chart. And what we do is we outline either with words or with pictures or with pictures and words the steps that we want our students to take so they build a schematic. Schema is all the stuff that you know. You dump it out. You dump out your schema. You dump out what you know. A schematic is the way that your brain encodes that information. So if we overtly teach them how we want to bring in the information, the teaching, the thinking piece, then they naturally have a scaffolded way to bring in that information. Some children just do this learning naturally. They're the ones that are just so, you know, they're so gratifying to teach out of the blocks. You're like, hey, somebody gets it, you know, throwing at them and they just take it right in and move with it. And some of those kids are the kids that could sit in a corner with a book and teach themselves. So that's not really on me. That's probably more on you and your DNA and your home environment. But for some children, it doesn't come naturally. They're confused as to how to get to the information, and it looks so easy for everyone else, especially us as teachers, because we're big and we just can do everything. So it's okay to struggle in front of them a little bit, too, so that they see the struggle is real and it's all of ours. So I wanted to share my Steps to Mastery chart for this lesson. So this is a step chart. See the little stairs and a little person walking up them? Again, I'm not a fabulous artist. I just do my best. But sketch and go. So the first thing I want them to do is when they are looking at these pictures, I want them to see it. See it. So here's some eyes. See it. So they're looking at the picture of, I did a cat. Here it's a dog. And then the letters, the line for the missing letter, and then the letters that are there. Then I want them to say it. So they're going to say what they see. This is a cat. So they're going to say, cat, cat. While they're saying it, they're going to be hearing it. I want them to think about it, and they're going to isolate the element. What is it that they're trying to find in their smart brain that they didn't see when they looked with their very curious eyes? So when they looked at it, there was a blank space. When they said it, they filled it in, k, at, k. So they're going to isolate that element of k. They're going to think about it. Here's a thinking bubble. Think about it in their brain. And then they're going to find the symbol for the k. First, they're going to look in their smart brain. And they may have it. If they can't find it in their smart brain, this is why you want a chart. Now, some learners can locate the symbol on the chart easily, and they don't need any support. Some learners are going to need some ancillary support, and that's going to come in the form of the picture. Now, you as their home support provider can help them isolate it. So if they just randomly pick something, let's just say they pick this. Cat. That's the symbol. And in your mind you're saying, honey, that's... No, no, it's not that. That's not it. It's right here. Put on the brake. Back of the bus. Let's replay and let's do it differently. You want them to do all the work. That's already in your head, and that's great, but it's also in their head in some form. So all you're going to do is throw out a lifeline to them. 
You're going to make them use their own strength to grab a hold of that ring and pull themselves over to the boat. And then you're going to help them kind of get on, get on top of the boat. But you want to make them do as much work as possible. And you'll have to gauge it with your learner. But what you would say, what I would say, encourage you to say is this. Oh, that sound goes with a symbol that's in this line. Can you find it? So now you've isolated that. So if they went there, and what I would also do is cover what they've done so they can't go anywhere else. So now you've narrowed down their choices. They can't go anywhere else. So maybe they'll accidentally pick the right thing, or maybe they won't. Maybe they say, oh, that's it. Cat. Cat. And you're thinking that's a bear. I know that's what we think, too. Like, be concerned. Be very concerned. What are they thinking? Clearly they're not. And then what you do is instead of saying, no, no, it's not that, it's this, because what they do is have learned helplessness. They just wait for you to tell them stuff, and then they copy it down, which means they're not really doing the work. Our goal as teachers is to jump them up on Bloom's taxonomy and the depth of knowledge charts, which are the ways that we think, and we want to up-level it. We want them to go into deeper places to think. So even with little kids, you can do this. So what you're going to do here is, again, you're going to just throw them a ring. they got to get on the ring themselves. Now you'll isolate this and say, no, it's cat. At which of these? Now, obviously, you can see a cat, so that's you know gonna make it easier. But if they couldn't see the cat, or if they picked the wrong one, now it's only between two. So you're still making them do the work. So they're either gonna pick this or this. Let's say they pick this. Again, you're gonna question like who you married and the DNA line. Won't be you, or it might be you. Just saying. Okay, so let's say that they pick D. You know it's C. You still don't give it to them. You say, D, at, dat? It's not a dat. It's a k, at, cat. So while you've told them, you haven't told them which one it is. You've just shown them which one it is. Then you cover it again and you say, which of these would you use for cat? Hopefully they're here. Otherwise, you do the same thing again. Don't change your tone of voice. Don't change the words you use at least the first time. Just reinforce, it's not a d-at-dat, it's a k-at-cat. Can you say k-at-cat? K-at-cat? You can even take their finger. K-at-cat? Then you give them back their finger. And you say, which one is it? Eventually, they will probably come to the C. If they don't, you then can take their hand, hold it on it, and say, k-at-cat. Which one is it? And then you can say, it's a k-at-cat. Which one is it? Once they've gotten it, you say, good job. I knew that you could do that. Good job. Then you want to get them over to the other charts. Which of these is the same as this? And again, you're going to want to isolate everything around it if they're a struggling learner. If they're not a struggling learner, you don't need to. But some kids can't differentiate between the pieces of information. And even though we can see it clearly and easily, their eyes are moving and jumping from side to side, and they're not necessarily seeing what we're seeing. It can feel very frustrating to you as an adult because you can see it. You can see it, but they can't always just because you can. When your voice changes, when your posture changes, when anything that's conveying to them your frustration or discontent or anger they will read that and whoop, the brain shuts down instantly. They go into an amygdala response, which is a tiny little almond shaped place in your brain that's kind of here, back here. And it is our survival spot. It's the guard dog for the brain. And what it tells us is danger, 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 danger. Once upon a time, it was run from the tiger that's going to eat you to escape the parent who wants to eat you. They're upset. I'm not sure why. I didn't do something right. Or I did something wrong. I can't remember. I don't know what I did. Note to self, don't do that again. But I can't remember what I did. And then they either... <sighs> start crying or they wiggle around or they run away from you or they get mad at you because it's called fight 
life for free. So to the degree that you can hold in your anxiety is to the degree that you will be successful with them. Be patient. Learning is really, really, really hard work. And patience, learning, behaving, patience you can't necessarily learn. You can learn to behave patiently. It can be done. We do it every day. We do it every day. You've got this. Even if you weren't an elementary school teacher, you are now. You can do it. I'm your life coach. You've got this. What I'm going to tell you is behave patiently. Eventually it will catch up. Just behave that way. Because once you do something that threatens them or they feel threatened by it, they shut down and your work just got harder. So if you thought you were frustrated a minute ago, try making some little five or six year old uncomfortable. Now, you're going to be real uncomfortable. So once they find it here, then they're going to transfer it to the page. Now, some of your kids will just be able to just write it on the page. Then I would make them come back and say, where is it on this chart? Find it fast. What is it in between on this chart? What is it above? Is it vowel or is it a consonant? Does the capital look the same as the lowercase? Where is it on this chart? What is it for? What is it start? What is a word that starts with k? Can you think of any other word? So you just want to just keep making them work, 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 work. In my classroom, work is always rewarded with more work. In your classroom, work should always be rewarded with more work. Neurologically, they're firing. Make sure that you keep that firing going by just adding more to it. And it can be simple, simple, simple things. So then, once they have it in the chart or they have it in their mind's eye, their brain, you're going to have them make it in the air. Make it in the air. And they have to clean the air in case, you know, they left stuff up there from before. And make it in the air. You can give them a little um, sing-songy chant as to how to do the letters. If they have one from school or a song, great. If they don't know one and you don't know one, you can make one up or you can look online. So going to make it in the air first and you're going to see if you see what they're making is the letter that you want them to make. Then they're going to race it in the air and then they're going to bring it down to the page. So here's the page and then they're going to write it down on the page. So this is our step chart. See it, say it, think about it, isolate the element, then Find it in your smart brain, symbol in your smart brain, and these are symbols. If you can't find it in your smart brain, even if you can't find it in your smart brain, find it on a smart chart. Move from one smart chart to another smart chart, then make it in the air, then write it down there. Okay, so that just took something that might have taken them uh, three minutes to do, and now you've made it even longer. What you're doing in that process is you're teaching them how to do that over and over and over, not just on this page, because later when they're not filling in missing letters, you're going to want them to generate their own words out of their own head and commit it to paper. This strategy is the same strategy. The only thing they're not going to do is be able to see it somewhere. They're going to have to see it in their smart brain. So they'll say it, they'll see it in their smart brain. Then they're going to have to either find it in their brain or find it on the smart chart. All you're doing is taking one piece out. And the more they've seen things like this, the more likely they are going to be able to see it in their smart brain. On this page, it's a dog. Well, it's a CVC word, consonant, vowel, consonant. I know we do that a whole lot. We use all these acronyms and you don't know what we're talking about. Ugh. So CVC, consonant, vowel, consonant. If they've seen that, and it'll repeat itself in a lot of worksheets because it, they can usually draw a dog, they know what a dog is, and it's a simple word using simple letters that are easy to construct because D, O, and G all use almost the same shape right across, so that makes it even easier. But if they've done this kind of work and seen this a lot of times, they're going to transfer that to other things pretty quickly. So, they might see it in their mind's eye. So I'm going to do just a few on my whiteboard so that we can do them together. And then I'm gonna to give you some strategies for how you can extend this learning.